Welcome, YouTubers, to another episode in my Grammar Hero series. In today's video, I'm going to be working out the practice problems from the seventh full length practice test on my website. In case this is your first time finding my YouTube channel, I quickly want to mention this. I have a website called asvabapp.com, and there you can take seven full length practice tests, including this one. If for some reason you don't want to go to my website to take this practice test, you're more than welcome to follow along here on YouTube. But in order to get the most out of this video, here's what I'd recommend. I'd recommend that you pause the video after I read each question, attempt to work out the question on your own, and then resume playing the video to check your solution. As a reminder, you're not permitted to use a calculator or a reference sheet on Yazvab. So regardless of where you work out these questions, Try not to make use of any of those resources. Uh, finally, I want to say this. Uh, in the description of this video, I'm going to include timestamps for each question. Next to the timestamps is going to be the topic that the question is testing, as well as a link to a video in which I discuss that topic in greater detail. So if at any point you feel as if you need more help with one of these questions, just look in the description and there you'll find those links to my other videos. So all that being said, Let's go ahead and get started with today's video. All right, so uh, number one here says, there are 350 people at the school basketball game. The ratio of students to adults is six to one. How many students attended the game? All right, so if you watched my video on ratios, rates, and proportions, you'd realize that in order to solve a word problem uh, involving a ratio, you actually use a proportion to do that. But that said, uh, this problem is a little bit tricky because it's asking us to find out how many students attended the game. That's an unknown, so we'll call that X. But that said, we're only given a ratio of students to adults. And what's more, we're only given information about the total number of people at the game. So we're going to have to use some logic prior to setting up our proportion. Again, this ratio of 6 to 1 means that for every six students who were at the game, there was one adult. All right, so let's use that information to set up our proportion correctly. Again, a proportion is nothing more than two fractions that are equal to each other. And in the left-hand side of the equal sign, uh, you fill in the information that's given. And on the right-hand side of the equal sign, you fill in the information you're trying to solve for. Well, in this case, what do we know? We know that six out of every seven people who were at the game, again, if there were six students at this game and one adult at the game, that means there were seven people at the game in total. So that's the proportion we're gonna use. Six students out of every seven people has to correspond to X number of students out of the total of 350 people who are at the game. All right, so now that we've set up our proportion correctly, it's just a matter of cross multiplying. So we're gonna do seven times X, which is seven X equals uh, six times 350. And since I can't do that in my head, I'm gonna work it off to the side. We have 350 times six, uh, zero times six is zero. Five times six is 30. So we're going to drop down a zero and carry a three. Six times three is 18, 19, 20, 21. So this is seven X equals 2100. And now to solve for X, we're just going to divide both sides by seven. This crosses out here and leaving you with X equals. And this is actually pretty easy to do mentally. We have 2100 divided by seven. Well, 21 divided by 7 is 3, and we'll just drop down those uh, two zeros. So x referred to the number of students who were at the game in total, and we can see that that is uh, 300, which is b in this case. All right, so again, that's a variation of a ratio problem. It requires a little bit of critical thinking, but that said, uh, everything else was pretty straightforward. So uh, that's that one. All right, uh, number two here says a pair of jeans that regularly sells for 
$110 is currently on sale for 25% off. What is the sale price of the pair of jeans? All right, so uh, I made a video called uh, Finding Discounts, uh, Tax Tips, Double Discounts, and Original Price. So if what I'm about to do is something with which you struggle, go ahead and watch that video. I break down these problems in much greater detail. But as we can see, this problem is asking us to find the sale price of the jeans. So I'm going to say sale price is equal to the original price of the jeans minus the discount amount times the original price of the jeans. And we have uh, both of these things here. The original price of the jeans was $110, and the discount amount is 25%. Well, on the ASVAB, whenever you're given a percent, you're going to express it in decimal form. And the decimal form of 25% is 0.25. Again, this is our discount amount. So with those things identified, let's just plug them into this formula we quickly wrote and solve. Original price was $110. Discount amount was 25%, which is 0.25 in decimal form, times the original price, which is $110. All right, and by solving this, we'll know what our sales price is. Uh, first things first, we have to take care of this multiplication involving this whole number in decimal. And I'm going to do that off to the side. This is 110 times 0.25. That is to say, we're multiplying a whole number by a decimal. In order to proceed, you want to take this decimal in 0.25, and you want to shift it two times to the right, such that this becomes 110 times 25 with no decimals. But once we work this out, we're going to have to take the decimal place and shift it to the left two times to account for the fact that we moved it to the right up here. Uh, so let's go ahead and work this out now. Uh, 5 times 0 is 0. 1 times 5 is 5. 1 times 5 is 5. Uh, before we start multiplication with this 2, we have to bring in a 0 placeholder. 2 times 0 is 0, 1 times 2 is 2, and 1 times 2 is 2. Let's add these together. 0 plus 0 is 0, 5 plus 0 is 5, uh, 5 plus 2 is 7, and 2 plus nothing is 2. Let's bring our two decimals back in, 1, 2. All right, so we can see this becomes 110 minus 2750. And I can't do that math in my head, so I'm also going to work that off to the side. We have 110 minus 2750. All right, so now we have another problem. We're subtracting a decimal from a whole number. Thankfully enough, that's pretty easy to fix. We can add a decimal here and two zero placeholders, and now we can proceed. Zero minus zero is zero. Zero minus five we can't do, so we're going to have to borrow. We can't borrow from this zero, but we can borrow from this one. So this one's going to become zero, and this zero is going to become 10. We're going to have to borrow one more time, so this is going to become nine, and this will become 10. 10 minus five is five. Drop down your decimal in place. Nine minus seven is two. And then this is 10 minus two, which is eight. All right, so we can see the sale price of these jeans is 82.50, which is A. All right, so uh, that's that one. All right, so uh, number three here says, a student earned a grade of 80% on a math test that had 30 problems. How many problems did the student answer correctly? All right, so this problem's a test of your ability to uh, identify the relationship between fractions and decimals. And let me explain why. Again. This 80% can be expressed as a decimal like this, 0.8. And how do we convert fractions to decimals? We simply do long division. Uh, all right, so with that in mind, let's take a look at this problem again. How many problems did the student answer correctly? That's an unknown, and in math, we express unknowns with variables. In this case, I'm going to call it x. So how many x of the... 30 questions did the student answer correctly. And by doing this long division, we know it has to equal 0.8, which stands for 80%. So clearly, we're just solving for x in this case. 
And our very first step is to clear this 30 from the denominator. So I'm going to multiply both sides by 30. This will cross out here, leaving me with just x. And as we can see, x is 0.8 times 30. And I'm going to work that off to the side. We have 30 times 0.8. That is to say we're multiplying a whole number by a decimal. And as we've previously seen in this video already, we want to clear this decimal by moving it to the right. In this case, we're going to move the decimal one place to the right, such that this becomes 30 times 8. And once we work that out, we'll move our decimal one place back to the left. Uh, 8 times 0 is 0. Uh, 3 times 8 is 24. Move our decimal back to the left once. And we can see x in this case is 24. And x refers to the number of questions they answer correctly. So we know that is going to be D, 24 questions. All right, so that's that one. All right, so uh, number four here says Randy earns a monthly salary of $600 as well as a commission of $100 for every sale she makes. How many sales must she make to earn $10,000 in one month? All right, so to answer this problem, we actually have to convert this word problem into an algebraic expression, and it's not as difficult to do as you think. Again, we're told Randy earns a monthly salary of $600. And in addition to that monthly salary, so in addition to the monthly salary, uh, she earns a commission of $100 for every sale she makes. Well, we don't know how many sales she makes, so we're going to represent that with a variable. I'm just going to call that x. So that's going to be 100 times x. And we want to know how many sales she has to make in addition to her monthly salary to make $10,000 in one month. All right, so just like that, we express this word problem algebraically. And now we're just going to solve for x because x refers to the number of sales she makes. Uh, so first things first, let's subtract 600 from both sides. This crosses out here, leaving you with just 100x over there. And 10,000 minus 600, you should be able to do that in your head, but we'll work it out anyway. 0 minus 0 is 0. 0 minus 0 is 0. Uh, 0 minus 6 we can't do, so we're going to look to the left to borrow. Can't borrow from a 0, so we're going to have to borrow from this 1. This is going to become 0. This will become 10. Borrow one more time. This will become 9, and this will become 10. 10 minus 6 is 4. 9 minus nothing is 9, and 0 minus 0 is nothing. All right, so we can see that 100x equals 9,400. Let's divide both sides by 100 now. This crosses out here, leaving you with just x. Uh, this is actually pretty easy to do. We can cross out corresponding 0. So we can cross out a 0 there, a 0 there. So this becomes 94 over 1. And if you read this like this, 94 divided by 1, you would know that this is 94. Again, anything divided by 1 is just itself. So 94 divided by 1 is just 94. And as we can see, Randy would have to make 94 sales in order to make $10,000 in one month. All right, so uh, that's that one. All right, so number five here says the diameter of a bicycle wheel is 35 inches. If the wheel completes 100 revolutions, how far did the bicycle travel? Use 22 over 7 for pi. All right, so in this case, we're looking at a bicycle wheel, which is going to be a circle. And what's more, we know this bicycle wheel has a diameter of 35 inches. Well, diameter is defined as the distance from one edge of the circle to the other edge of the circle and through the center point of the circle. Again, that distance, according to the problem, is 35 inches. All right, so to answer this problem, we have to decide whether we're going to use the formula to find the area of a circle or to find the circumference of the circle. Well, let's think about this for a second. We want to know how far this bicycle traveled. So we want to know the distance around this circle, which is circumference, and then we're going to have to multiply that by 100 to figure out how far the bike itself went. All right, so to find the circumference of a circle, you use this formula. Circumference equals pi times diameter. But in this, in this case, we're going to have to modify this formula a little bit. 
because we know uh, this circumference formula is just the distance around this circle once. We know this wheel completed 100 revolutions, so this is going to be 100 pi diameter. All right, so now that we made that modification, let's go ahead and solve this one. This becomes 100. What is pi? We're told to use 22 over 7 for pi. And what is the diameter? It's 35. All right, so by multiplying 100, 22 over 7, and 35, we'll know our answer. Uh, this, believe it or not, is much easier to do than you think. So don't stress about that. Let's take it one at a time. Let's take this 22 over 7 times 35, and let's work it off to the side. We have 22 over 7 times 35. All right, so we're multiplying a fraction by a whole number. Again, if you watched my video on fractions, you would know that we can simply write 35 as a fraction by placing it over 1. And now we can actually reduce this before doing this multiplication. I can say 7 goes into 7 one time, and 7 goes into 35 five times. So this is 22 over 1 times 5 over 1. Again, 22 divided by 1 is just 22. 5 divided by 1 is 5. So this is 22 times 5. So let's work that out. Um, 2 times 5 is uh, 10. Carry a 1. Uh, 2 times 5 is 10. Plus 1 is 11. So this becomes 100 times 110. And now we just have to work that out. I'm going to work that out off to the side so as not to make any mistakes here. We have 110 times 100. Uh, 0 times 0 is 0. 1 times 0 is 0. 1 times 0 is 0. Before we start multiplication with this second digit in 100, we actually have to bring in a 0 placeholder. 0 times 0 is 0. 0 times 1 is 0. 0 times 1 is 0. Before we start multiplication with this third digit, we bring in two zero placeholders. One times zero is zero. One times one is one. One times one is one. Let's add this all up. Zero plus zero plus zero is zero. Zero plus zero plus zero is zero. Zero plus zero plus zero is zero. Zero plus one is one. One plus nothing is one. So we can see that C in this case is uh, 11,000. And this tells us the distance that this bike travels if its wheel completes 100 revolutions. That's going to be 11,000 inches. All right, so uh, that's that one. So number six here says, during a football game at Dope Campbell Stadium, one-fourth of the people in attendance are older than 50 years old, one-third are between 25 and 50 years old, and the rest are younger than 25 years old. If there are 24,000 people in the stadium, how many of them are younger than 25 years old? All right, so I intentionally wrote this problem like this in an effort to overwhelm you with details. But let me say this. On the ASVAB, uh, the problem should work out quickly and evenly. If you're working out a problem and it's not as smooth as you think it should be, chances are you set up the problem wrong or you've made a mistake in your math somewhere. And let me show you how simple this problem is in light of that. All right, so again, we know there are 24,000 people in the stadium. One fourth of them are older than 50. One third of them are between 25 and 50. And the rest are younger than 25. Well, we're not given what fraction is younger than 25. So the first thing we have to do is figure that out. So I'm going to use a 1 to represent the total portion of people in the stadium. And then I'm going to subtract out the 1 fourth who are older than 50, as well as the 1 third who are between 25 and 50. And by doing this, I figure out what fraction of the people in this stadium are younger than 25 years old. All right, so we're working out this problem involving subtraction of fractions and a whole number. The first thing I want to do is rewrite this 1 as a fraction by placing it over 1. So this becomes 1 over 1 minus 1 fourth minus 1 third. All right, in order to add and subtract fractions, they all have to have the same denominators. In this case, we have a denominator of 1, 
4, and 3. How can we rewrite these fractions such that they all have a, the same denominator? Well, that common denominator is going to be 12, since all these go into 12. So let's go ahead and rewrite all these fractions such that they have denominators of 12. To write 1 as 12, I would have to multiply it by 12. And I also have to do that to its numerator. Again, 1 times 12 is 12. 1 times 12 is 12. To write 4 as 12, I would have to multiply it by 3. I'm also going to have to do that to its numerator. Uh, so 4 times 3 is 12. 1 times 3 is 3. To write 3 as 12, I'd have to multiply it by 4. I'm also going to have to do that to its numerator. 3 times 4 is 12. 1 times 4 is 4. All right, so now that these fractions all have the same denominators, we can combine them like this. Uh, 12 minus 3 minus 4 over 12. This is the same as 12 minus 7 over 12. And 12 minus 7 is going to be 5 over 12. All right, so 5 out of every 12 people in this stadium are younger than 25 years old. And now the question is, what is 5 over 12 times 24,000? So we're going to have to work that out next. 5 over 12 times 24,000. And as you can see, we're multiplying a fraction by a whole number. What you want to do is quickly write 24,000 as a fraction by placing it over 1. And now you should be able to say this. 12 goes into 12 one time. 12 goes into 24,000 how many times? Well, 12 goes into 24 two times. And we can just bring up these uh, three zeros. So this is 5 over 1, which is the same as 5, times 2,000 over 1, which is the same as 2,000. 5 times 2,000 is 10,000. So 10,000 uh, of the people in the stadium are 25 years old, are younger than 25 years old, which is C in this case. All right, so that's that one. All right, so uh, number seven here says the following colors of M&Ms are placed in a bowl. We got four yellow, six orange, three green, five blue, and two brown. If you close your eyes and randomly select one from the bowl, what is the probability that you select an orange one? All right, so uh, this is actually pretty easy to do. Our odds of selecting an orange one are this. There are six orange M&Ms in the bowl, and how many M&Ms are there uh, in the bowl in total? Where there are four yellow, six orange, uh, three green, five blue, and two brown. So by working this out, that is six divided by whatever this total is, we'll know what our probability of picking an orange one is, which I'm going to call probability of picking an orange M&M. So let's work this out. We have six over uh, four plus six is 10. Uh, and what do we have here? We have three plus five, which is eight. Eight plus two is 10. So we have 10 plus 10, which is 20. All right. So this is six over 20. And um, if we look at our answers, we can see that they're all given in terms of a percent. Well, as we've seen in this video already, we can write uh, fractions as decimals by performing long division. And what's more, we can then quickly convert that decimal into a percent. So I'm going to treat this 6 over 20 as long division. I'm going to read it like this. 6 divided by 20. All right, so let's go ahead and work this out. We start by asking ourselves, how many times does 20 go into 6? It doesn't. So again, technically, there's a decimal right here after this 6, and we can add a 0 placeholder. Once I add this decimal here, I have to bring it up right here. And now I'm going to disregard this decimal in 6 uh, down here. So I'm going to read this as 60, not 6.0. Again, I count it for the decimal up here. All right, and again, I said... 20 did not go into 6, so we can actually put a 0 up here to represent that. Now the question is, how many times does 20 go into 60? Well, 20 times 3 is 60. 60 minus 60 is 0. So 6 divided by 20 is 0.3. How do we convert this decimal 
into a percent. We would multiply it by 100. And when you multiply a decimal by a power of 10, such as 10, 100, 1,000, uh, 10,000, and so on, all you do is take that decimal and shift it to the right according to how many zeros there are in the power of 10. In 100, there are two zeros. So I'm going to take this decimal and 0.3 and shift it one, two times to the right, and I'm going to add in a zero placeholder. So this becomes 30%, which is answer choice A. All right, so that's that one. If you struggle with basic probability, please watch my video on basic probability. I show you how to break down these problems in that video, and it's very helpful. All right, so uh, that's that one. All right, so uh, number eight here says, how many feet of a wire fence is necessary to enclose a garden that is square and has an area of 169 square feet? All right, so uh, the crux of this problem is we're trying to enclose a square garden with wire fence. So in other words, our fence is gonna look like this. It's gonna be in the shape of a square. All right. And to determine how many feet of wire fence we would need, we would have to add this length of fence to this length of fence to this length of fence to this length of fence. In other words, we would have to find the perimeter of this square, okay? But that said, we're only given information about the area of this square. We're told that the area of this square, according to the problem, is 169 square feet. And the question is this, how can we go from having the area of this square to finding its perimeter? All right. Well, we should know that in squares, all the sides are equal. So this side's equal to this side, which means that side's equal to this side, and that side's equal to that side. So if I call this side S, that means this side's S, this side's S, and this side's also S. All right. So if we solve for S, we should be able to figure out what the perimeter is. Again, we just add up all of the sides. All right, so how do we find the area of a square? Area of a square is always side squared. All right, we know what that area is. So in place of A, we can actually put 169. So this becomes 169 equals S squared. To get S by itself, we'll take the square root of both sides. This will cross out here, leaving you with just S. Uh, square root of 169, you should know, is 13. So S, in this case, is 13. So in other words, our square looks like this. Has sides of 13, 13, 13, and 13. Well, how do we find the perimeter of a square? That's always side plus side plus side plus side. Again, we know what those sides are. They're all 13, so it's 13 plus 13 plus 13 plus 13. This is the same as 4 times 13. And what is 4 times 13? We can work that off to the side if we need to. We have 13 times 4. Uh, 3 times 4 is 12, so we'll bring down a 2 and carry a 1. 1 times 4 is 4 plus 1 is 5, so that's 52. So we're going to need 52 feet of fence uh, to enclose this uh, garden uh, completely. So this is C, 52 feet. All right. So make sure you know the relationship between uh, the area of a square and its perimeter. If you're given one, you can easily find the other. All right. So number nine here says the price of spiny lobster in New York is $12 per pound. This is 150% of the cost of spiny lobster in Florida. How much does spiny lobster cost per pound in Florida? All right, so believe it or not, this problem tells you exactly what to do. Uh, it says the price of spiny lobster in New York is $12 per pound. So we're going to say that's 12. And then it says this is 150%. Well, in math, is is always equal. So $12 is 150%. Uh, as I've said in this video multiple times, we're going to express percents in decimal form. The decimal form of 150% is 1.5. So this is, is 12 equals 1.5. 
of the cost of spiny lobster in Florida. Well, in math, of is always multiply. So let's go ahead and put that down there. The cost of spiny lobster in Florida. Well, that's currently an unknown. We're actually trying to solve for that. So in math, you can represent unknown values with variables. And in this case, I'm going to call it x. So this says 12 equals 1.5x. All we do is have to solve for x now. So we're going to divide both sides by 1.5 here. This crosses out here, and this leaves you with x equals uh, 12 divided by 1.5. All right, so we're going to have to work that out. Again, we can read fractions as long division like this. 12 divided by 1.5. And as you can see, we're doing long division involving a decimal and a whole number. And the key to getting this right is to realize this. If the decimal's just inside this division bracket, you don't have to make any adjustments to proceed. If, however, the decimal's outside the division bracket, you have to shift that decimal such that the number outside the division bracket becomes a whole number. So in this case, we want to shift the decimal in 1.5 one time to the right. And when we do that, this becomes 15. But that said, to keep proportionality, we have to shift the decimal inside the division bracket a corresponding number of times. So in 12, there's technically a decimal right here. We're going to move it one time to the right and add a zero placeholder. So this becomes 120 uh, divided by 15. All right, so this should work out evenly. So I'm going to say my answer is either going to be 8 or 7. And instead of trying to figure this out, I'm actually going to take 15. I'm going to multiply it by 8. Hopefully that gives me 120. So 5 times uh, 8 is 40. Drop down to 0 and carry a 4. 8 times 1 is 8 plus 4. That's 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So 15 times 8 is 120 with no remainder. So we know x in this case is going to be 8, which means the cost of lobster, or spiny lobster in Florida, is $8 per pound. All right, so uh, that's that one. All right, so uh, number 10 here says, if the ratio of the side length of square A to the side length of square B is 3 to 11, what is the ratio of their perimeters? So in my past three videos that I've uploaded, I've mentioned this. The ratio of the side lengths of two squares is the same ratio as their perimeters. So if you've watched those past two videos, you would say, oh, they have a ratio of 3 to 11 for their side lengths. Therefore, the ratio of their perimeters is also going to be 3 to 11. All right, that said, um, in case you're a new viewer, let me go ahead and show you how we can figure that out logically. Again, we're comparing two squares in this problem, notably square A and square B. So let's call this square A, and let's make a bigger square and call that square B. What's more, we're told that the ratio of their side lengths is 3 to 11. All right, that means if this side's 3, this side's 11. All right, well, what do we know about squares? In squares, all the sides are equal. So if this side's 3, this side's also 3, this side's also 3, and this side's also 3. Likewise, if this side's 11, means this side's 11, this side's 11, and this side's 11. All right, so now we want to compare the ratio of their perimeters, right? That's what the problem's asking. Well, how do you find the perimeter of a square? You simply add up all of its sides. Uh, so this perimeter of square A is going to be 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3. That's the same as 4 times 3. And 4 times 3 is 12. So the perimeter of square A is 12. What about the perimeter of square B? Again, that's going to be adding up all of its sides. So that's going to be 11 plus 11 plus 11 plus 11. That's the same thing as 4 times 11, which is 44. All right, so what is the ratio of their perimeters? Well, it's 12 to 44. But that's not answer choice, so we must be able to reduce this somehow. 
Well, we can. We can divide both of these by 4. 12 divided by 4 is 3. 44 divided by 3 is 11. All right, so we can see that the ratio of their side lengths is 3 to 11. And likewise, the ratio of their perimeters is also 3 to 11. All right, so that's how you would solve that one logically. Uh, it's not too difficult, but you do have to know some information about squares to do it. Uh, so that's that one. All right, so uh, number 11 here says, at Bobby Bowden's car dealership, a particular model comes in three trim levels, 10 different colors, and two different interiors. How many different versions of this car can be created from these options? All right, so to figure this one out, we're gonna make use of the fundamental counting principle. And the fundamental counting principle says this, in order to figure out how many different combinations there are of something, you simply multiply each of those different options by each other. So in this case, let me go ahead and uh, box this for you so it's a little bit clearer. Again, we know that as far as trim levels go, there's three options there. We're gonna multiply that by uh, the number of different colors we can get our car in, and there's 10 of those. And then finally, we're gonna multiply that by uh, the number of different interiors we can pick from and there are two of those. By doing three times 10 times two, we'll figure out how many different versions we can make of this car. So that's three times 10 times two. Uh, this is actually pretty easy to do mentally. Uh, three times two is six, six times 10 is 60. So in total, uh, you can make 60 different versions of this car given these different options for trim level, colors and interiors. If you struggle with that, please watch my video on the fundamental counting principle. Again, it's a little bit difficult to explain how it works, but in that video, which is about 40 minutes long, I actually show you the logic behind the fundamental counting principle. So please watch that video if you struggled with what I did here. All right, so that's that one. All right, number 12 here says Chuck Amato's scores on his first four history tests were 94, 85, 90, and 95. In order to get an A-plus in the class, he needs to have an average of at least 92 or better. What score must he make on his fifth test to get an A in the class? All right, so in this case, we're trying to find um, his class average. And you may recall that to find an average you find the sum of your data points divided by the total number of data points that there are. All right, so that's easy enough. Uh, in this case, we know he wants to have an average of at least 92. So average in this case has to be 92. What's the sum of his data of his test scores? That's gonna be 94 plus 85 plus 90 plus 95. That said, we have to include his unknown score on his fifth test. So I'm going to represent that unknown score with an X. And we're going to divide this by the total number of data points that there are. There's one, two, three, four, five here. All right, so all we have to do is solve this uh, expression for X, and we'll know what score he needs on his fifth test to have a 92 average in the class. So first things first, I'm going to multiply both sides by 5 to clear it from the denominator over here. This crosses out here and here. And let me scroll down a little bit. This leaves you with uh, 94 plus 85 plus 90 plus 95 plus x over here. And i got to work this out since I can't do it in my head. This is uh, 92 times 5. 5 times 2 is 10, so drop down to 0 and carry a 1. 9 times 5 is 45, plus uh, 1 is 46. So this becomes 460 equals 94 plus 85 plus 90 plus 95 plus x. All right, so we want to solve for x. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to combine these before I move them over here. 
So that's 94, 85, 90, and 95. Add those together. 5 plus 5 is 10, plus 4 is 14. So we're going to drop down a 4 and carry a 1. Um, this is the same thing as, um, again, 8 plus 1 is 9. So this is 9 plus 9 plus 9 plus 9. In other words, that's 9 times 4, which is 36. So this is 364. So this becomes 460 equals 364 plus x. Again, we're solving for x now, so just subtract 364 from both sides here. This crosses out here, leaving you with just x on this side. And now we got to do 460 minus 364. 0 minus 4 I can't do, so I have to borrow. This becomes 5. This becomes 10. 10 minus 4 is 6. 5 minus 6 I can't do, so I have to borrow. This becomes 3. This becomes 15. 15 minus 6 is 9. 3 minus 3 is nothing. So we can see x in this case is 96. And this x represents the score he has to get on his fit test in order to have a 92 average in the class to get an A+. plus. So the answer to this one is A, 96. All right, so uh, that's that one. Pretty difficult problem, but this problem is very common on the ASVAB. The numbers aren't going to be the same. The person certainly isn't going to be the same but the uh, way you work out the problem is going to be identical. So make sure you can work out these problems. All right, so uh, number 13 here says, Work done, walk the dog from 6.40 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. one day. If he was paid at a rate of $9 per hour, how much did he earn that day? All right, so first things first, we have to figure out how much time there is between 6.40 to 8.30. And as it happens, many of you could probably do that mentally. And you would say from 640 to 740 is one hour. And then you would say from 740 to 840 would be another hour. But since we're only going to 830, that's going to be 50 minutes. So you would say from uh, 640 to 830 is an hour and 50 minutes. All right, if you can't work that out mentally... I'll go ahead and uh, do it off to the side here. Again, we're trying to figure out how much time there is between 6.40 to 8.30. And to start, I'm going to say from 6.40 to uh, 7.40 is one hour. From 7.40 to 7.50 is 10 minutes. And from here on out, I'm just going to go up by 10 minutes. So it's very clear as to what I'm doing here. From 7.50 to 8 o'clock is 10 minutes. From 8 o'clock to 8.10 is another 10 minutes. From 8.10 to 8.20 is another 10 minutes. And finally, from 8.20 to 8.30 is another 10 minutes. All right, so uh, let's total up all these 10 minutes. There's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. So again, we can see that uh, from... 6.40 a.m. to 8.30 a.m., there's a one hour and 50 minutes. That said, we're trying to figure out uh, how much work done here gets paid per hour. So uh, we're going to have to find a way to express this hour and 50 minutes as a fraction, and it's not that difficult to do. Okay, we have one hour, and what is 50 minutes expressed as a fraction? Well, that's 50 minutes over 60 minutes. Again, there are 60 minutes in an hour. We can cross out these corresponding zeros, and this becomes 1 and 5 over 6. All right, so he walked the dog for one hour, 1 and 5 sixths of an hour, and we're just going to multiply that by his hourly rate of $9 per hour. All right, so we're multiplying a mixed number by a whole number, and this isn't that difficult to do. 
So uh, just bear with me here. First thing I want to do is convert this mixed number into an improper fraction, and it's going to be this. Again, our base of 6 is not going to change. Uh, 1 times 6 is 6, plus uh, 5 is 11. So this is 11 over 6 times 9. And we can express 9 as a fraction by placing it over 1. So this becomes, again, we're multiplying fractions here, so we're going to be multiplying straight across. This becomes 11 times 9, which is 99 over 6 times 1, which is 6. And by working this out, we'll know how much he's getting paid. Again, we can read this as 99 divided by 6. This is actually pretty easy to do. 6 goes into 9 one time without going over. 6 times 1 is 6. 9 minus 6 is 3. Drop down this 9. How many times does 6 go into uh, 39 without going over? That's going to be 6 times, given that 6 times 6 is 36. 39 minus 36 is 3. And now we actually have to add a decimal here and a zero placeholder. Once we do that, we'll bring up this decimal right here and drop down this zero. Now the question is, how many times does 6 go into 30? That's 5 times, given that 6 times 5 is 30. 30 minus 30 is 0. So his total pay is going to be $16.50, which is answer choice C. All right, so that's that one. Again, you have to be good at telling time for the ASVAB. You have to be able to write hours and minutes to be in terms of fractions. And then you have to be able to do math involving the multiplication of a mixed number and a whole number to get this one right. So quite a few steps to get this one right. All right, so that's that one. All right, so number 14 says, together a husband and wife earn $125,000 per year. If one of them earns $25,000 more than the other, what is the amount of the smaller income? All right, so for this problem, we have to translate it into an algebraic expression, and then we're going to have to solve that algebraic expression. And let's get started by saying this. We know we're talking about the incomes of two different people, and those are currently unknown. So if I say one person earns X dollars per year, the problem tells us the other one earns 25000 more than that. So that would be X plus 25000 All right, so clearly this is one person's income, and this is the other person's income. And again, according to the problem we know, combined, they make $125,000 a year. So it should be clear at this point that we're just going to be solving this expression for x. Um, and that will tell us what the amount of the smaller income is. Because again, x is clearly smaller than x plus 25,000. All right, so let's get started doing that. We have x and x, which are like terms, so we'll combine them to be 2x plus 25,000 equals 125,000. All right, let's uh, subtract 25,000 from both sides now. All right, this crosses out here, leaving you with just 2x here. 125,000 minus 25,000 is just 100,000. I'm not going to work that out. You got to get good at mental math at some point to be successful on this test. All right. So now we're going to divide both sides by 2. This crosses out. And this is actually pretty easy to do as well. What is 10 divided by 2? That's 5. And then drop down these four zeros. 1, 2, 3, 4. So we can see x is 50,000. And x is, as I mentioned, the smaller income. So we know... Smaller income is D, $50,000. All right, so that's that one. All right, so uh, 15 here says Christian Ponder bought two boxes. The first box is square with each side measuring 10 units, and it is four units high. The second box is rectangular and has twice the volume of the square box. If the height of the second box is 5 units, the width is 10 units, what is the length of the second box? All right, so for this problem, we're simply comparing 
the volumes of a square box with the volume of a rectangular box. So uh, we need to know both of those formulas. This is going to be my square box. To find the volume of a square box, it's side squared times height. To find the volume of a rectangular box, it's length times width times height. All right. And in case it's not obvious, we're told that this rectangular box over here has twice the volume of this uh, square box. So let's find the volume of this square box, and that will help us uh, figure out what we need to know about this rectangular box. All right, so uh, this is actually pretty simple. We're told this square box has a side measuring 10 units. So that side is our 10. So in place of S here, I'll put 10. And uh, we're told it's four units high. So that's going to be H. So this is 10 squared times four. Let's work that out. This is volume equals. What's 10 squared? That's 100 times four. What's 100 times four? That's 4. All right, so the volume of our square box is 400, and that would be units uh, cubed. All right, well, what do we know about the volume of this rectangular box? It has twice the volume of this uh, square box. So what is 2 times 400? That's going to be 800. So I know the volume of this rectangular box is 800. So in place of V, I'm going to put 800. All right. And let's see what else we know about this rectangular box. Um, it has a height of five. So we know that's five. Um, a width of 10. So that's going to be 10. And we want to know its length. So we'll leave that as L. So clearly, we're just going to be solving for L here. And let's go ahead and do that now. What is 10 times 5? That's 50. So this is 50. L equals 800. Let's divide both sides by 50 now. This crosses out here, leaving you with just L. And again, L refers to the length of the second box. We can cross out these corresponding zeros here. And this becomes 80 divided by 5. Well, if you can't do that in your head, you can always read this as 80 divided by 5 and do the long division accordingly. How many times does 5 go into 8 without going over? It's going to be 1 time. 5 times 1 is 5. 8 minus 5, that's 5, 6, 7, 8. That's 3. Drop down this 0. Uh, 5 goes into 30. 6 times 5 times 6 is 30 with no remainder. So the length of this uh, second box is 16 units. All right, and we can see that is C. All right, so that's it for this one. You didn't have to draw anything. You just had to be very comfortable with finding the volume of a square box as well as finding the volume of a rectangular box. So you had to know those two formulas to get this one correct. All right, so that's all there is for this one. Pretty challenging problem in my opinion. All right, so 16 says a train goes twice as fast downhill as it can go uphill and two-thirds as fast uphill as it can go on level ground. If it goes 120 miles per hour downhill, how long will it take to travel 45 miles on flat land? All right, so uh, for this one, we should recognize that we have all the elements of the distance formula. Again, the distance formula describes the relationship between distance, rate, and time. More specifically, it says distance is equal to rate times time. If you're given R and T, you can find D. If you're given D and T, you can find R. And if you're given D and R, you can find T. Well, let's take a look and identify what's given to us in this problem. How long will it take? Well, how long is referring to time or T to travel 45 miles? Well, 45 miles is a distance. Okay, so uh, we know we're going to be solving for T and we know what D is. So let's start plugging things in. We have 45 equals R times T. Again, we're solving for T. What about rate? Is this 120 miles per hour downhill our rate? It's not because this is the rate of the train downhill and we want the rate of the train as it goes across flat land. So uh, we're going to have to convert this rate of 120 miles per hour to be in terms of 
uh, the train's rate as it goes uh, across level or flat land. So let's go ahead and work on doing that now. Again, um, we know that the rate of the train as it goes across flat land is unknown. So we'll call that X. But according to the problem, it goes two thirds as fast uphill as it goes across flat or level ground. So uh, uphill is two thirds of X. And then finally, as far as downhill goes, it says uh, the train goes twice as fast downhill as it can go uphill. So that's two times two thirds X. And let's go ahead and quickly work this out. And I'm gonna do it off to the side. We have two times two thirds. We're multiplying a whole number by a fraction. So I'm gonna rewrite this two as a fraction by placing it over one. Then I'm just gonna multiply straight across. So this becomes two times four, two, which is four, one times three, which is three. So this is four thirds X. All right. Now we can actually make this conversion uh, from the speed or rate of the train downhill to the rate of the train across flat land. Again, the rate of the train downhill is 120 miles per hour. And we know that is four thirds of the rate of the train as it goes across a uh, flat or level ground. So if we solve for X, we'll figure out the rate of the train across flat, flat ground which will enable us to plug in R here. So let's go ahead and solve this one. We wanna get rid of this uh, 4 thirds by multiplying it by its reciprocal, notably 3 fourths. And we're gonna do that to both sides of the equation. This will cross out here and here, leaving you with just X on this side. And now we gotta figure out what 3 fourths of 120 is. Well, I could write 120 as a fraction by placing it over one. Then I can say this, Four goes into four one time, four goes into 12 uh, three times, and I'll just bring up that zero. So four goes into 120 30 times. So this becomes three over one, which is just three uh, over our times 30 over one, which is 30. So three times 30 is 90. So X is 90 in this case. That means the rate of the, sp the speed or rate of the train across level ground is 90. So now we know what R is. R in this case is gonna be 90. So let's just go ahead and plug that in and solve accordingly. This becomes 45 equals 90 times T. Again, we're solving for T. So let's divide both sides by 90. This crosses out here, leaving you with just T on this side. 45 divided by 90 is the same as one over two. So T in this case is one over two. And time is always referring to uh, hours. So this is one half of an hour, which is the same as 30 minutes. So in this case, it will take the train 30 minutes to go 45 miles on flat or level land. All right, so that's that one. Pretty difficult problem. All right, so that is it for this video. As usual, you're more than welcome to leave feedback in the comment section below. And as always, I hope you found this video helpful. If you like the content I'm creating, please consider subscribing to my channel. But on that note, I'm gonna go ahead and cut you loose. Konnichiwa.